to Target Jobs National Pupillage Fair and welcome to the Talks programme. My name's Matt, I'm actually the bar editor for Target Jobs Law, um, which you've probably got in your bags along with the, the pupillage, Pupillages Handbook. Um, I'd like to introduce you to your speakers. We've got Georgina Wolf from Five Essex Court, um, and we've got Anton Van Dellen from uh, I Goldsmith. From Goldsmith, <laughs> yes. Um, both here to talk about human rights law, which is a bit of a change to the advertised programme. Um, but nonetheless very, very interesting. So I'm going to hand you over to your speakers. Well, thank you very much, everyone. It's a beautiful day outside, so it's very kind of you to spend your time in here listening to us talking about human rights. You've got both sides of human rights in front of you because I tend to act on behalf of the defendants and Anton tends to act on behalf of the claimants. So we'll give you a pitch for both sides and you can make your decision as to what draws you and attracts you the most. Um, we thought we'd talk a bit at the, just at the outset about what human rights law is, because it, in a way it's a misnomer to call it an area of law itself. It's simply the area of law that has arisen from the Human Rights Act 1998, bringing in the European Convention on Human Rights into English law. And so in that sense, it's not a discrete area of law. It's something that permeates almost every other area of law. You probably won't find too much human rights in areas like commercial chancery work, but you will find it everywhere in things like immigration, education, police law, which is what my chambers specialises in particularly, any work involving the government, um, things like prisons law, environmental law, mental health law. It has a really wide reach, and I think that that reach is extending all the time you see human rights arguments being very creatively deployed in all sorts of different areas of law. So it's an incredibly exciting area to practice in, and it's very fast-moving. Because it's relatively new, it's something that people are trying lots of different things and really pushing at the boundaries. And there are all sorts of different areas of human rights, from the EU Charter to the Convention, that are being used in courts in ways that they've never been used before. So it's a really exciting place to be working. Um, I'd like to echo what Georgina said about thank you for coming. Um, I'm sure you can all think of plenty of better things to do on a beautiful day than, that, that like this than sit in a basement and listen to the two of us. Um, uh, Georgina's absolutely right. Um, uh, the sets tend to be divided broadly into defendant sets and claimant sets. Um, so you'll see uh, sets such as five uh, Essex, sergeants, uh, six KBW, St Andrews Hill regularly acting for the government, uh, providing counsel for Treasury solicitor, and on the other side, um, the usual suspects, including Goldsmith, acting for the claimants. And that's unusual for the bar, because the bar encourages people to act for both sides. So, so we are slightly unusual in that respect. In case you think Georgie and I, and I agree on everything, um, I don't even think there is such a thing as human rights law. Um, and uh, members, uh, I'm on our chamber's pupillage committee, um, and we all roll our eyes when somebody writes in going, I want to be a human rights lawyer. And we're like, oh, no, you know, this is real kind of, um, you know, guardian reader stuff. Um, <laughs> human rights law is everywhere. Um, I, I, do, I, I no longer practice criminal law. Um, but I used to do some prosecuting, and there it's very important to be a fair prosecutor to know uh, to know what what the defendant's human rights are. Um, but I do general civil. I do a mixture of claimant work, judicial reviews against the government, immigration work, family work, landlord and tenant work. Everywhere there are human rights issues cropping up, and and we're adapting our submissions to reflect uh, human rights. Um, my client base tends to be very much first-generation expat, West African, Eastern European, Pakistani. And what they have in common is they are very poor and they tend to run into difficulties with landlords, uh, with the government, with people that have much deeper pockets than them and can pay for lawyers as eloquent and as clever as Georgina um, sitting next to me. So, so we are very much on the back foot in, when it comes to, uh, to the resources at our disposal. Uh, in general human rights terms, in my immigration work, we're finding in the last two years we've had a complete hammering. 
uh, human rights have been distinguished practically into oblivion in the immigration setting. Article 8 is now subject to a test of exceptionality under Gulshan. Um, the threshold for sending British citizens back to, uh, with their spouses, back to countries they have never lived in is insurmountable obstacles. Article 3 in an immigration setting is subject to a very high test of exceptionality where you expect it to die within a matter of weeks going back to your country. It's very, very, very difficult to, write human, to run human rights arguments in an immigration setting. Um, we're also finding that uh, the direction that we're getting from the judges as to how to structure our human rights arguments have changed. And you can do no better than read Lord Toulson's speech in Kennedy and the Law Commission. What Lord Toulson has said is don't run European Convention rights at the top of your submissions. You start with English common law and the English common law's approach to rights. And if that doesn't assist you, only then do you move to European Convention. An obvious reason for that is the law lords are conscious of this move to try and pull uh, England and Wales out of the European Convention and is basically sending out a message to lawyers that your first port of call should be the English common law. So, so things are changing in terms of, of how we make our submissions in, in human rights terms and we start very much in a public law statutory construction uh, approach, move to an English common law approach, and only then, in desperation, reach to the bottom of our bag for, for Article 8, um, knowing that it's very likely to fail. Um, out of six or 8,000 judicial reviews we do for immigration, about 80 succeed. So we're, we're on a bit of a, a, a hammering as claimants, um, now that I've got you all feeling very sorry for me, um, and ill-disposed towards Georgina, um, I'll let her carry on. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we've been asked to address a number of questions, so I'll do that, and at some point I will tell you why it's so wonderful to be on the, decide, the side of the defendant. Um, the first question was why you chose the bar, and in particular why you chose the relevant area of practice. Now, I suspect that you're all sitting here because you have already chosen the bar, and you don't need me to give you the hard sell as to why the bar is such a wonderful career. Um, it is. It's completely fantastic. Um, very briefly, the reason I chose it was because I wanted a job where I would have a degree of independence and I would regularly be challenged and have a real intellectual side to my career, and I find that the bar provides that. Why I chose the relevant area of practice is a funny question to answer because I did not choose to do human rights law. In fact, I positively avoided human rights law. I thought at law school that all the clever people were doing human rights law and I didn't really think I had any chance against them. One of the things I was told when I first started in practice is that you don't choose your practice, your practice chooses you. And I think that that's very true and that is how I have found myself going down this human rights path. What I really wanted to practice and, and have the pleasure of practicing is police law. And what drew me into police law, and it's a very unusual niche, and many of you probably won't have heard of police law or know what it entails. I liked the interest and the fun of crime, but I knew that I was probably a bit too soft to deal with the gritty side of crime. And police law offers exactly that. You have the fascination of what's going on in the street with police officers, but you don't have the nasty, unpleasant side of things. So you're one step removed, which I really enjoy. And it involves work from inquests, civil actions against the police, such as false imprisonment, malicious prosecution, which is incredibly unusual because it involves civil jury trials, which for me was incredibly attractive. But it also has this public law and human rights side, which is where I find my practice has taken me. And it's an incredibly exciting area to be working in because it's so fast moving, it's so dynamic and it's very creative. So that's how I, how I came to be um, sitting in front of you today. Um, much like Georgina, um, I, I landed up in uh, claimant uh, work. Um, not, not necessarily by design. I did my pupillage in a chancery chambers um, and then discovered I wasn't that keen on sitting in a room for months on end, uh, not going to court. So um, I, I particularly enjoy um, advocacy. I enjoy going to immigration tribunals, judicial reviews in the high court. Um, much like Georgina, my practice finds me. So um, I've landed up doing a lot of cash seizure cases against border force. I never would have dreamed I'd be trying to persuade uh, a, a court 
that 14,000 euros stuffed into underwear was not concealment. Um, and and um, f- for, for some bizarre reason, they actually agreed with me. Um, but, uh, but, but over time, the solicitors you work with will tend to send you a particular array of cases. And it's about being flexible enough to say, uh, yes, from a chancery background, how would, how would I ever have dreamed of doing immigration law? But when your solicitors regularly send you that type of work, and it's relatively attractive work, not in terms of remuneration, but in terms of, of uh, the, the, the type of legal submissions that you're crafting, um, you start developing an interest in it. It's not well paid on the claimant side. Um, and in fairness to Georgina, compared to the commercial sets, it's not well paid on the defendant's side either. Um, we would run an entire court of appeal case for £500, and that's the solicitor and me being paid out of that. Our clients are not at all wealthy. Um, and if, if you, if, if, unless you are prepared to work for not particularly large sums of money, uh, if you're doing claimant work, your clients are, are going to struggle to pay you if you say, well, I'm not prepared to pitch up to court unless you give me 2000 3000 5000 pounds. I wouldn't have very many clients um, because they just, they're just not in those jobs where they can afford to pay their lawyers that amount of money. That means from a claimant point of view, I need to expand my practice, have, do some commercial work to effectively subsidize my claimant work as well. So I'll do a few commercial cases. Um, I have to know contract law as well in order to to be able to survive doing claimant work. So my practice will tend to be a lot broader than Georgina's. She, for our respective years of call, uh, she she specialised much more than I have. Um, That's no criticism of Georgina. In fact, quite the opposite. I, I look quite enviously at somebody who can say that that's my area of practice. It's police law and specifically public law. Um, as a junior barrister, I need to pretty much come deal with what comes through the door. But that makes, in my view, that makes the work particularly interesting. And, and I enjoy meeting clients from a variety of different backgrounds. We've also been asked to address what types of cases barristers practising human rights law do. And we've touched on that quite a lot already. I think it's worth just flagging up a few other areas. First is that you will often find you're doing some urgent work in human rights cases. There could be real implications for your client if something isn't done very quickly and you could find yourself going up before a judge even over the telephone on New Year's Eve because a case has such significance. You will usually, in my experience anyway, find yourself in either the High Court doing a judicial review um, or in something like the First Tier Tribunal in the Immigration Courts, that sort of work. So there's a massive overlap in public law and some of you may have attended the public law talk earlier. I'm I'm going to give you now my my spiel about why it's so good to be a defendant practitioner. And I really believe if you want to change the world, and I know it's such a naive thing to say, and if you put it down on your pupillage forms, you probably won't get too far. But if you do in your heart really want to make a difference to mankind, I think there is no better way of doing it than being on the defendant's side. And that might shock some of you, because I know it's more attractive to say that you want to represent the little man fighting against the big institutions. But actually, the big institutions do get things wrong. And if you're on their side and you sit down with them at the point at which you get a letter before claim or the claim form has come in and you say, look, you have messed this up. This is how you can make it right. You need to change your policy, change the system that you apply, and you need to make it right for this poor claimant who you treated so badly. I have to say, this isn't, of course, the case in most of the cases I do (laughs) where my clients are always in the right. But in that sort of situation, you can really make a difference immediately. And I've done cases where I've been in the privileged position of sitting around a conference table with somebody very senior from the police, from the government, and explaining why they've got something wrong and them listening to me and actually going out and implementing that change so that the system has changed before the case has even come to court. And that is a real privilege and a joy. And you can wake up in the morning and feel good about yourself because you are making the world a better place. You also can genuinely do things like saving lives, which is pretty amazing. And you can do that on both sides by the work that you do. And I think that that is a great, a great honour to be in a position where you can do that. So please don't assume that acting on behalf of the government, on behalf of the state, is being the bad guy. It isn't always being the bad guy. Sometimes it is. 
But if you really want to make a difference, I, I can't recommend enough acting on behalf of the defendant. I, I fully endorse what Georgina says. And in, in fact, there's, uh, there, there's probably far more scope to improve things more broadly acting for the defendant than there is for the claimant. Acting for the claimant, you have to get used to losing a lot. We lose and lose and lose and lose. Um, and we argue some very tenuous, very hopeless cases. Our clients often have been illegally overstaying for very long periods of time. Uh, they've got extensive criminal records. Um, they are highly undesirable individuals to remain in the jurisdiction. And we're trying to persuade um, quite a fusty judge that actually shouldn't be sending them back to somewhere where their lives potentially are in danger. Um, and, and it's a hard sell. Um, and so if, if unless you're, you start developing a fairly thick skin fairly early on, um, you, you, you begin to wonder whether anything you touch ever works out okay, um, because it just seems to be an endless string of defeats. Um, there is, it's the original lastminute.com um, the claimants arrive. They've missed every deadline that there's been. They haven't submitted any papers. Their hearing is tomorrow morning. The papers are in a complete mess. Um, and you're somehow having to try and salvage something out of the situation. Lots of telephone hearings trying to prevent deportations late at night. They're due to be put on a charter flight at Stansted. We're on the phone an hour before that trying to persuade a High Court judge that they shouldn't be put on that charter flight. Um, you can make a difference. We've got quite a few people off charter flights, quite a few people out of detention centres. We haven't got them leave to remain, but we've had little victories on the way. Uh, and the same with claims against the police. The police will often not want to fight something in court in the full glare of publicity, settle with our clients rather than, than, than have a full-on slog and fight. Um, but you have to get used to losing quite a lot because it happens with depressing regularity. <laughs> We've been asked what we find appealing about this area of work, and I hope that you've already got a sense that we're both quite passionate about it. For me, one of the things I find most appealing is the enormous implications. If you've got somebody challenging a public authority, which is normally the case, um, as you can imagine, in a human rights case, that will probably have big implications, not just for that individual claimant, but for people throughout the country. And that is incredibly exciting. And just by way of an example, I was recently lucky enough to be working on a big police data retention case. And while we were waiting for judgment, I got a number of emails from barristers in the UK, but also in other jurisdictions, saying, we're waiting for this judgment, when are you expecting it? And it just showed there were all these other cases behind us that were dealing with the same issues. And that's really exciting to feel the implications of what you're doing. Other examples I can think of would be something like the, the assisted suicide cases. There have been a string of them um, over the last 10 or so years. These are cases with massive implications for everybody in the country. And it's a real joy to be able to work on them. The other thing um, for you that I think is a real benefit is that there are great opportunities for very junior barristers, even pupils, from day one. <laughs> the reason for that is that a lot of this work, as Anton says, is incredibly poorly paid and there's a huge demand for pro bono work. So you can get in on really exciting cases that go all the way up to the Court of Appeal and beyond by working um, for the Bar Pro Bono Unit. There's also huge opportunities in immigration work to get before first-tier tribunal judges. And, and that is a real advantage, I think, of this particular area of law. Um, again, I agree with Georgina about the scope for junior practitioners to do uh, work. Um, one of the things that's frustrating in Chancery is there isn't necessarily a great deal of scope for advocacy um, at, at the very junior end. Um, in terms of, of what I find appealing about it is dealing with clients whose first language is not English, who have a great deal of difficulty navigating through whichever judicial system or quasi-judicial system they're facing, whether it be a tribunal or, or, or a court. And even if you don't win, the sense that, well, at least they've retained their dignity and they've given it a good go, as opposed to just being railroaded into being deported or railroaded into uh, accepting uh, things, things that shouldn't have happened to them. Um, and and, and that, that, that's a satisfaction which you're going to have to take some solace from because you're certainly not being paid very well uh, for that sort of stuff. Um, 
it does also impact uh, looking at, at some of the things Georgina and I were going to speak about on lifestyle as well. Um, because so many things are last minute, um, I've lost track of the number of engagements I've had to cancel and um, the number of things that you just keep on cancelling and cancelling and cancelling. Um, and, and you do have to steal yourself for this. It is not a sort of thing where you think, well, I'm going to carefully plan out my life and I'm, you know, a week from now I'm going to have dinner at this restaurant with this friend of mine that I haven't seen for this length of time. It's pretty much guaranteed your life it will be continually just ripped up and, and clients take priority. Uh, I, I see Georgina chuckling next to me. It's exactly the same on the defendant side because if we on the claimant side are, are doing things at the last minute, so the, the same thing is happening whatever I'm working on, the defendants or the solicitors and barristers are working on as well. So, so it, and I know this seems very romantic when you start out to like, oh yes, how exciting, I, you know, I'm abandoning my plans to do X, Y, Z. When you've met, when you've missed the fourth dinner engagement that you carefully set up, um, everyone starts getting a bit frayed about it. And, and it's, it's just realizing what this entails as opposed to people who maybe have done some paralegal work where you're in at nine, you're out at five. This isn't that sort of job at all, unfortunately. Um, my last weekend was completely messed up with telephone hearings. The entire weekend uh, was spent trying to sort out somebody's warrant for eviction um, being overturned. Um, and you may think, well, it's a warrant of eviction. How, you know, how important is this? Well, for them, very important. Um, but it completely made the weekend a complete disaster area. Um, and we got it eventually, which was, which was nice. Yes, you've got to keep in with your friends from bar school because they're the only people who'll understand. <laughs> Um, uh, Anton is right, it, it's true that this, this area of law, and I'm afraid many other areas of law, and just life as a barrister can play havoc with your social life. I find Saturday night is just about the only time where you're pretty much guaranteed that you should be able to meet your engagements, but even then it's not guaranteed. Um, so that can certainly be a challenge. Um, the other thing I think is worth mentioning, and some of you may have been concerned about, is of course the government has been making quite a lot of rumbling noises about overturning the Human Rights Act and repealing it and replacing it with something else. Now, personally, and we obviously I can't predict the future, but I don't think that that will have a huge amount of implications for a human rights practice. It may be that you're looking at different legislation, but as Anton rightly said, the first um, line of attack will always be the common law anyway. And secondly, if the Human Rights Act is repealed, it's going to be replaced with something. It enshrines into our law such important rights, you know, the right um, not to be tortured, the right to have your liberty, the right to respect for your private life. These are such fundamental rights. They are going to be replaced with something. Now, it may be that the EU Charter has wider um, application. I don't know. Some, lots of this area of law, as I say, is still being hashed out in the courts. But I think it's very unlikely that if the Human Rights Act is repealed, that it will simply wipe out human rights law. In fact, I think the opposite. I think chances are it will create a greater opportunity for, for lawyers, for barristers, to argue more um, interesting cases and creative cases about the law that does apply and what, what is brought in. So I don't think that there are... Um, I think that the huge changes that we may see in the future probably won't de sort of decimate your practice if you do go into this area of law. Um, there are huge changes afoot when it comes to legal aid and funding, as I'm sure many of you are aware of. And this government, the last government, have been quite concerned to try and reduce legal aid as much as possible. And that will have a knock-on effect because fewer cases will be put before the courts. But as I said, I think that this is an area of law that is here to stay. Um, and I certainly hope that it will be here for many years to come. Um, I'm pleased Georgina mentioned about funding. Um, it won't have escaped your notice that the publicly funded sets um, have been decimated by the cuts in public funding. Uh, we've seen massive cuts in family law. Um, public funding in immigration is now essentially only available for asylum work. Um, there have been huge cuts in funding for criminal law as well. Um, that clearly is having an impact on the number of pupillages that are available. What you probably don't realise is a number of people go through pupillage and then leave the bar in their first or second year of tenancy, go and work for government legal service or treasury solicitors or go in-house. Um, you need to go into this with your eyes wide open. 
Um, this is uh, this is not uh, something to be toyed with. Um, be very aware of the problems that there are with with funding uh, claimant work and publicly funded work and, and legal aid. Um, probably the biggest difference between Georgina and I is how we get our cases. Um, Georgina, no doubt, relies heavily on O'Clark's um, chamber's reputation in the area of police law and as a premier defendant set. As claimant barristers, we work in a very, very different way. Our work will often not only come from solicitors, but it will come from interpreters, and we will be instructed on a direct access basis. A lot of my time is taken up with marketing, meeting interpreters, meeting agencies that deal with um, expat communities in London and in South East England. Um, our funding stream and the way we attract work is very, very different. The skill set that you need as a claimant barrister is not only your legal skills. You can be the best barrister in the world. If the work is not coming through the door, you're going to starve and your landlord's going to turf you out and give you a warrant of eviction. Um, you need to develop marketing skills. You need to understand how direct access barristers are instructed. The rules have changed around direct access barristers. You can now become a direct access barrister straight out of pupillage. All of our junior tenants are becoming direct access barristers. They all understanding how website work, uh, mark online marketing works, how search engine optimization works, keywords. Um, marketing events in, in local communities, Iranian communities, Turkish communities, any expat, expat communities where this type of claimant work uh, survives. These aren't legal skills. These are commercial marketing skills, and these are skills that, that you need to develop as a junior tenant um, in order to survive in this environment. The bar is, is, is undergoing huge changes at the junior end, um, particularly in the publicly funded bar. We have to change how we work because we cannot rely on the legal aid agency to, to give us our paycheck because we're just going to end up starving. And Anton touches on one of the other questions we've been asked to address, which is what key skills and personality qualities that we think you need to succeed in this area of law. I think that you, I mean, you will hear from every barrister, I'm sure, that you need intellectual ability. And I think that that's particularly applicable when it comes to human rights law and public law. But I think you also need an appetite for the law itself. Now, that might sound obvious, you're, you all want to be lawyers. But in this particular area of law, you don't have those same opportunities for devastating cross-examination. I love cross-examination. It's one of the most enjoyable parts of my practice. But it doesn't really come from my public law human rights practice. The reason for that is that in judicial review claims, which is where a lot, as I've said, a lot of the human rights law will take place, you very rarely have actual witnesses, and it's mostly on legal submissions. So you need to bear that in mind, that that is going to be the day-to-day -day work that you're doing will not involve that witness-handling side. It will involve the intellectual analysis of the law. I think you need to be able to think creatively, particularly if you're on the claimant side and you want to think about how to, to bring about the result that you want. And I think you need to be able to cope with stress and to be able to think very quickly on your feet. There are areas of law where you will be working in slow time a lot. If you want to do a tax, to be a tax barrister or a, or a commercial barrister, you'll very rarely be in court and you'll often have had a long run up to your court hearings with which to think about all the different arguments. That is rarely true of human rights or public law. There's a much quicker turnaround of cases, partly because the limitation periods are much shorter than in other areas. So you need to be able to think very quickly um, and deal with the stress and pressure that that comes with. And I think you also need to be very determined and ambitious because it, it is a hard area of law to get into, I, as you will all have known from the horrible statistics that I'm sure you've been told by law schools and, and all of um, the barristers you've spoken to. It's hard to get into any area of law. But I do think that public law and human rights is so fashionable that there are huge numbers of people who want to, to get in. So you really need to be determined and you, want to, you need to want to change the world. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I'd agree entirely about academic uh, and intellectual rigour. Um, there's obviously a strong flavour of public law in this area. Uh, you need to be comfortable with principles of statutory construction. Um, when you read the case law, um, some of the best crafted submissions are around novel construction 
uh, of, of statutes and legislation. Um, if you're not comfortable with that, um, maybe um, public law, immigration, that type of work is not for you. That's not necessarily to say that human rights principles don't apply in other settings, landlord-tenant, family, I act for lots of fathers who try to get contact to see their children. Um, that, you know, that, that's very satisfying work. Again, not very well paid, very, very satisfying work. Um, it's not particularly intellectually rigorous, I'm the first to admit, which is probably why uh, I then enjoy <laughs> doing those hearings. Um, but, but again, it's something where there are human rights principles involved um, and where you can make a real difference. It, it's about finding your particular practice and how your practice evolves over time. Um, I, I thought we've got a few minutes left and I thought it might be helpful if we haven't put you off a human rights <laughs> practice just to talk about some of the things that you can do to improve your CV to show pupillage committees that you're interested in this sort of work. Um, the first thing is the free representation unit which some of you will know does social security work and employment work. Now that doesn't Im immediately sing of human rights but it's a brilliant opportunity to get yourself out doing actual advocacy work it looks really impressive on your CV if you can say, I've done this many cases. It looks less impressive if you just say, I'm free trained. We're wise to the fact that you can be free trained and not have done any cases. But it's a wonderful opportunity because it gives you real client contact and the opportunity to get before a tribunal. So I can't recommend FRU highly enough. Mooting is obviously very good because it shows that interest in the law itself and it gives you that experience of what I've described, the making legal submissions without the witness handling side of things. And then I really recommend working for NGOs and charities and there are a number of, um, of NGOs who offer wonderful opportunities for students in your situation. One of them would be the National Centre for Domestic Violence which encourages students to come and help with being a Mackenzie friend, which again will get you court experience um, and also will help you again to do something good for mankind. You can also do things like being an independent visitor of prisons and police stations, which involves going along unannounced often and checking that the people who are being detained are being treated fairly. Um, and that again will show that you're engaged in the sort of issues that will come up in human rights cases. Because what you want on your form, when you come to um, filling out the form, which I'm sure you're, is at the front of all of your minds at the moment, it's not just saying, I'm passionate about human rights. It's about showing it. And the most impressive and persuasive way you can do that is by pointing to your own experience and saying, look, I can demonstrate this. It's much more impressive than just saying that you're interested in it. Uh, I'd, I'd agree entirely, and um, particularly, uh, the, uh, to my mind, the advantage of FRU is that it is a different style of advocacy and different procedure in tribunals compared to a courtroom. Um, for those of you who've, who've, who are currently or, or, or will undertake the BPTC, um, you're being trained in a very specific style of advocacy that's appropriate for courtrooms. Um, when, you, when you go to tribunals, it is different. Um, some tribunals may sometimes feel more formal than a courtroom, thinking of some of the professional regulatory tribunals. But most of the tribunals are not. They are intentionally less formal, and the style of advocacy is different, um, and, and the way things are, are structured is different as well. So it is very, very good experience um, to, to get involved in that and, and, and do that. Um, after Chancery, I wasn't on my feet at all in my Chancery second six. It was exactly the same as my first six. And I then went and did a whole raft of Social Security Tribunal uh, cases. It was invaluable experience in terms of, of uh, honing my advocacy and client, client care skills. Yeah, and, and don't be deterred by the fact that you may feel completely ill-prepared for this sort of work. You, you know, you've probably never actually represented anyone. You think, gosh, I haven't yet finish the bar course, how can I help someone? You really have so much to offer and you'll see it when you start to do the work. I remember the first social security case I did and the lady I was representing couldn't read, she didn't understand the documents that were in front of her and I was able to really assist her simply because I could tell her what was going on, I could tell her what to expect, I could tell her the arguments that she needed to make. You don't need to be a QC to be doing this work, you can make a real difference immediately. And also don't be too deterred. I was beaten the other day by a free representation unit rep who hadn't done a day's advocacy in her life. Um, so even from um, before you finished the bar course or even started the bar course, 
um, you're in a position to really make a difference for, for people that you're, you're representing. Just a few questions? Or? Yeah. Um, we've got a, a few minutes to go, so um, throwing the floor open to, to any of you to ask any, any questions at all. If you want to raise your hand, I'll start on the left. And... Yeah, sure. Um, hi, thanks very much. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask about was um, you spoke about having a broad practice, uh, and I'm actually really interested in the same, but the impression I've got from speaking to barristers and all these various events that, that you go to um, is that exactly for that sort of marketing kind of reason? You're really encouraged to kind of specialise, um, and there's there's no such thing as a broad practice. So if that is something you're interested in doing, is that realistic, or is it something not to mention but have in the back of your mind? Sort of. I, I think you can probably uh, cover it on both angles, saying, well, I have a particular interest in X, Y, Z. I have a particular interest in medical law and medical law in a public law context. That is my particular area of interest. Uh, but I will turn my hand to anything that comes through the door. Pocket cash seizure case comes through the door. I'm there with my pen ready to you know, write strongly worded letters to the border force. Um, so uh, I think it's a, it's a combination of saying, well, yes, I, I have got a particular interest, but I'm open to, to doing other things as well. I think it is possible to ride both horses. It has to be phrased particularly carefully. You're absolutely right. Chambers will often steer you in a particular direction or you'll land up working with a group of solicitors who've got uh, actions against the police, for example, or have got a lot of immigration work. And over time, your practice will naturally start looking in a particular way. But I think particularly at the junior end, you want to say, well, I'm, I'm ready and willing to do anything, basically, um, which is how I landed up doing some family law. I just like, yep, yeah, if you want me to do some family law, I will happily go off to Bow County Court and argue some family law. I don't have a problem with that at all. So, so I, think, I think you can. It, it's all about how you express it and, and how, you, uh, and, and how you, you show to Chambers, yes, I do have a particular interest, but I'm, I'm happy to do whatever you want me to do as well. I, I completely agree. We are, I can only speak for my chambers, but we are all aware, I think, that you won't have had a huge amount of time to actually engage in particular areas of law. You will, some of you will have done, like I did, the GDL. You will have spent a year studying academic law, but you won't have any idea, really, of what the practice entails. So what we look for is an enthusiasm, people who are willing to try new things, but also an awareness of what our practice areas are. I mean, as I've mentioned, we specialise in police law, but we also do a lot of employment law, we do personal injury law, we do public law that is outside from the police remit, we do immigration. So there's a huge range, and we, we look for people who are willing to try all of those different areas of law. Yes, there was another question over there. Hi. Um, I wanted to... It's possible neither of you really to answer because you both practice in London. Um, but I'm currently doing the bar at Northumbria, which is in Newcastle. And I have found that a lot of the human rights focused work is in London. So I wondered if you had any advice for someone who isn't geographically <laughs> located in, in London, because places like Reprieve, Brew, um, even Liberty, they're all very London focused. So I, I don't know how. That, that is true, and it's a difficulty yeah. that you face. Um, I mean, one of the things that you can do, there will be local legal advice centres and citizens' mm -hmm. advice centres, which, yeah. um, and they're usually quite happy to have volunteers. Mm -hmm. I, although I was in London, I, did, I volunteered to do that, and that gave me a wonderful experience and access to seeing all sorts of different parts of life that I hadn't seen before. So you can do that. Um, it is it is a problem, and it's a problem. I think that there is a wider recognition of, and there has been more. There have been steps taken recently to try and spread out the law. So you'll see that the High Court is sitting um, across the country. Um, but it, I'm afraid it is. It's just one of those unfortunate facts of life. What I would say from an immigration point of view is there's obviously lots of immigration work outside yeah. London. Um, so it is slightly horses for courses. If you want to do intellectual property it's going to be in London. Mm -hmm. Likewise, if you want to judicially review the Met Police, that's going to be in London. 
Um, but uh, certainly when we do judicial reviews, we're often judicially reviewing on the back of hearings that have taken place in Bradford, Stoke, Birmingham, Liverpool, all over the place. And you realise there's a very active bar in all of these places um, that's picking up all of this work. And I completely agree with Georgina. A lot of my colleagues attend local law centres, free law centres, and are picking up their work and their referrals and working with communities on the back of those. That's both within London and, and outside London as well. So it, it, it goes back to that marketing point. Um, it's realising where the work comes from and then tapping into that stream of work. Um, but I, 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 I have a lot of sympathy for you. It is, it is difficult because clearly just the volume of work is not there just by virtue of pop the size of the population. And also, the, 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 for the sort of work I do, a lot of immigrant work, that does tend to be very South East England, very East Anglia. I have lots of clients in Peterborough that are involved in you know, industrial injuries in, in those sectors um, because that's where immigrants tend to congregate, um, where there's a lot of very cheap, man a requirement for a very cheap manual labour. Um, that I find my, that's where I find my clients. <laughs> the, the, the upside, actually, of regional chambers is that they tend to be less specialised than the London sets, which is a huge advantage if you're still unsure about where you want to go. Um, you have more, I think, of an opportunity at some yeah. of the regional sets. I'm not so worried. Sorry. I'll... No, 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 not at all. <laughs> I, I was just thinking more in terms of specialised human rights work experience rather than practice. Um, but thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, the local law centres, they will be all over the place, and that's certainly a, a good port of call. How are we doing time-wise? I was just about to stop you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's quite right.